Hey everyone, welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have an interview with Little Martin, creator of the new series, Them. Them follows a black family that moves from North Carolina to an all-white Los Angeles neighborhood in 1953, where their idyllic home becomes ground zero for malevolent forces. Pretty nice, huh? Bigger than I looked in the pictures. When I think of home, I think of a place where there's love overflowing. You couldn't imagine a nicer place to live. I wish I was home. I wish I was back there with the things I've been knowing. This home is ours. Begins with one family. They came from someplace worse. We'll have to make this place worse. What's worse than worse? Heard them folks in Compton straight up evil, man. Fuck this. There's something bad in this house. I don't like it. We got our eyes on you. <laughs> we do this till it gets done. Guest host Sade Sellers and Little Marvin discussed using the horror genre to examine things like rage, grief, and trauma, how he got Lena Waithe on board as a collaborator, what he learned as a first-time showrunner, and more. Check it out. Welcome back, everyone. It's Sade here, and I'm with a very special guest, Little Marvin from Amazon's Them. Hi, am I okay to call you Little Marvin? I feel like calling a grown man Little Marvin is wrong. <laughs> it is, but that's my fault. <laughs> Not yours. <laughs> okay. you can, you're my, you, we're friends. You can call me LM, my friend. LM. Yeah. Okay, I actually feel more comfortable doing that. I was like, <laughs> man. I him. <laughs> and thank you for calling me a grown ass man. It's the first time I've, that's ever been said, so I will take it. What? <laughs> I, don't, uh-uh. I don't feel grown most days, but yes, I'm very, very grown. Well, I'm, just, I'm actually really excited to talk to you today because Them is on Amazon. And I think it premiered almost a month ago today as we're recording. Uh, Yes, just over. Yeah, just, just over, over a month. A month. Yep. And um, I have so many questions, but I am like we always do on the Right On podcast. Let's start from the top. If you could briefly summarize how you got to where you are today, like was it film school? Was it just learning? Let us know like where you came from first. I didn't go to film school. I did go to theater school. Um, I've been obsessed with television and film my entire life. Like since I was a kid, always loved television. Didn't really think it was an actual career. <laughs> just kind of loved it as a thing, but didn't know people actually did it and got paid, but I always wanted to. And so when I graduated from UCLA, you know, I pursued it with some vigor in my early 20s, but not enough. You know, I don't think I was fully prepared for the path, for the nose, for the time it would take to build a real career as a writer. You just, you're kind of out there kind of flying blind. And so I stopped in my 20s and, and thought, okay, this is not a career. I was right. Let me go off and make some cash. So I went off and, and <laughs> Had a career as a creative director and as a marketing executive for many, many years, and I absolutely loved that career. But in the back of my head was this secret obsession, you know, uh, this little voice that was like, you said you wanted to write for television. Like, that's what you wanted to do. When are you going to do it? So long story short, uh, about four years back, I decided to put myself up for a promotion at my job that nobody asked me to have. And with the idea being that if I got the promotion, I would stay put and forget about being a TV writer. And if I didn't get it didn't get it, I would quit that day and fly to Los Angeles and pursue it until it happened. And so, spoiler, obviously, I did not. You didn't get the job? Yeah. <laughs> didn't I was get like, the promotion. Oh, didn't, even get the job. didn't get the promotion. Uh, and quit my job that day and flew back and locked myself in a room and was determined to not give up till it happened. I didn't think this would happen. Uh, right. <laughs> but yes, that's how that's it went. That's amazing. 
Uh, first of all, I, I love that you took a bet on yourself, but gosh, what what if you did get the job? Oh my gosh. You ne- But that's the thing. You would never know. But here's the thing. I probably would have continued to be happy, but I would have been driving myself crazy with this constant question. I, I think what you realize, if it's really your passion, it, right. doesn't, it doesn't let up. I mean, it, this, it just wouldn't have let up, I think, but who knows? Skip, skipping along, since we are a shorter podcast, how how did we get to them and and getting a show to show run and Lena Waithe attaching? Like, how, you know, I know there's a lot of stories in the middle, but what's the, the workflow to get to there? Uh, wow. Well, a lot of serendipity, first of all. I mean, I, I, I wrote the pilot, uh, I think I want to say probably three years back. I did the rounds. I got some agents and I did the rounds for, for a few months and I got linked up with Miri Yoon, who's a executive producer at Vertigo with Roy Lee. And she asked me when we were signed up, she asked me, you know, who would you like to sign on as a collaborator? And I threw out Lena Waithe as a kind of a dare, almost just like, let's see what you can do about it. So I threw right. out Lena Waithe and she's like, hold please. And then like two days later, um, I was sitting down with Lena. Oh, wow. And yeah, it was that fast. And uh, Lena instantly just was, it was very clear. She was my collaborator from day one. Um, she's a champion for new voices and she was just fantastic. So I knew we'd found our partner. And then I want to say in short order, maybe three or four months later, it was set up and uh, we got, Yeah. Two seasons. And I'm just letting you know, listeners, right now, that is a very condensed version of the story. I, I, we only have 20 minutes. There I'm is sure. so, much, so much pain and sweat and fear that I'm not talking yes. about. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So not only anyone listen to this like, oh, that's all it takes. No, I'm, I'm sure there's more to the story than that, but we're only 20 minutes. Yeah. Five minute podcast, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I feel comfortable with you because you're family that we can have a conversation about this. So let's go to the day the trailer drops. I don't know if you're familiar with, with me, but I run a horror podcast and community called Afro Horror that focuses on black horror. Oh, yeah. And we cut, we came to your defense when the trailer dropped because you got a lot of crap online about, oh, it's just get out. And I particularly, because I know how this industry works, and I said, Hold the phone, y'all. You don't know how long this thing has been in production. You don't know when it was written. You don't know. Like TV is all, I think everyone imagines that TV is instant and that like, oh, you know, you write something and it comes out next month, but TV can be really yeah. long. So yeah. do you do you pay attention to any of the online reviews? I pay attention to absolutely none of them. Okay. Um, I, yes, no. Uh, okay. I learned very quickly to not, I'm not on Twitter. I will never be on Twitter, particularly <laughs> for that reason. Oh, yes. um, <laughs> I discovered, oh, Twitter's where they're very angry. No, I'm not going to go over there. Let me go, let me stay over oh, here. The best decision. Yes. It, yeah. So, uh, so no, I've kept myself largely cocooned away from it. But of course, you know, you still have friends who are like, hey, did you hear what they said about? And I'm like, oh, no, I hadn't until you reminded me. Yeah, Thank thanks, you very friend. much. Thanks, uh, friend. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say to you, I so appreciate you for being a defender. So thank you for that. And I also appreciate you for understanding timelines. This is the thing that's so crazy to me is that some of the comparisons were shows that were literally being made at the exact same exactly. time. Exactly, exactly. Because that's how our industry works. I, no. But I think anyone who works in this industry, they got it. Unfortunately, what happens is people who don't work in the industry, they jump to conclusions and they make comparisons. And it's unfortunate for you and for Jordan, who kind of got the other side of it, but he's so yeah. classy, he doesn't respond because it's just like, yeah. There's no stealing here. We're creatives making things that just have whoever got there first usually gets there first. That's it. And might I also add that like there are so few of us. You just named one other name. There exactly. are so few of us doing this. Right. That let's stop that, shall we, moving forward? Like let's allow the new let's allow these new voices to come out and live on their own. There's tremendous nuance and difference and complexity in all of our voices. We should all be able to come and play. So Yeah, I think that's it's a you know, it's a rock and a hard place as you're you're black, that's great. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen 30 Rock, but there's an episode of Tracy Morgan's directing Octavia Spencer and she walks in and he goes, Octavia, you're black. Great. And I'm like, That's literally, literally one of my favorite shows of all time. And I yes, I do show. remember that scene. <laughs> But I was going to say, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's hard for us, like you said, because there's so few of us in the space that there's almost that pressure of representing our entire community that other people don't get. Yes. You ever think about that? No, but I, I do think about how unfortunate it is that that is so. Hmm. You know, I think that like, 
let's be honest, there's a thousand and one things that center white folks that come out per day. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me to, 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 to discern one from the other, I might have a hard time doing it. Did I watch right. that yesterday or something? But those kinds of comparisons are never made. Yet it's true when black, when anything centers black folks, it tends to, um, to do exactly what you said, have to sort of speak for the world yeah. um, and for the, for a breadth of experience and for all of these things. Again, I think the more of us and the more voices that flood the market, Market and and the more sort of points of view that come in, hopefully that changes. But it's always been there that it's you no. Know. I agree with you on that point. Okay, so I want to get now we're the show is premiered. It's on Amazon. I I want to tell you straightforward. Uh, a lot of people, episode five is really hard to watch. It was hard for me to watch as well. Um, what are the conversations like with the network, with Lena, with the writers' room? Of like, we need to talk about this backstory for this character. Um, and how, how we're going to do that, because that, that's, I'm not spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, but it is a tough episode to, yeah. to digest. Yeah. It, it was a tough episode to make. There are so many layers to that. I mean, there's the layer of, of just kind of creating the scene and writing the scene, which is mm -hmm. one thing. And frankly, I, I fought tooth and nail against myself. And when it came to writing it, I, the minute it was sort of conceived, it terrified me in a way that I don't think anything has ever terrified me in terms of thinking about how to write it. I had a visceral reaction to, mm -hmm. to writing it. And so I put it off. But then for exactly that same reason, there was something so deeply authentic and terrifying and abominable about it in a way that, to my mind anyway got to that queasy sort of evil at the heart of the Jim Crow experiment in a way that I had not seen. And so I knew that I had we had to honor it. And so our team did uh, just mm -hmm. that. And and by the way, the, the studios as well. I mean, when they read it and, and as we brought it to life, we brought it to life with the utmost care. And, and mm -hmm. every single piece of it was absolutely worked through uh, and thought through. That said, we're not working with blinders on. We know at the end of the day, folks are going to have to engage with that. And there's going to be a reaction to it. Do you ever worry that, because yes, that uh, Jim Crow is a part of our history. And even though half the country pretends it's not, it is important for us to to talk about it and, and see it because it was horrible and still is horrible, the effects of it. But do you ever worry that for Black people having to relive that, that it might be traumatizing or that they may feel a certain way reliving moments of that his, of our history on screen? Um, I think so, but remember too, like, you know, like you said, I'm black. <laughs> like you, yeah, like you well, reminded, yes. <laughs> like you reminded me. Uh, really, thank you, oh thank you God. for that because I had no idea. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> like I, I, I am, and I come from a point of view that we gain nothing by silencing or forgetting. I, I know these things are challenging. I know they're difficult. I, I would also say this as a horror writer, mm -hmm. there is no way to divorce trauma and pain and grief and rage and all of the human emotions from great horror. So it, it poses an interest, and you get this as a horror fan, it poses a very interesting problem because you're like, well, wait a minute, it's a quandary. You're telling me that I can't explore these things and yet I am a black horror writer and I must explore these things. So that's where it puts us, right? And I've, I'm coming down on the side of like, no, I want to play in this space. And so I am going to be as honest as any white person would get to be with their rage and their trauma and their grief and their pain. They gonna, uh, they're never going to let me do another interview again. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, come on. No, white folks get to do it. I want to do it too. It's not fair, right? I'm getting so. fired tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I might be too. You we'll, we'll, talk about the show. <laughs> we'll go together. We'll start a podcast together. I might there be fired as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I don't get fired. Let's let's talk about the actual logistics of writing the show um, after the pilot episode. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Was this your first show running experience? Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, show, you you have season two coming back. So, what lessons are you going to bring with you from season two as your first experience show running? Like, what's something you're saying? Okay, I didn't really do it that great this time, but I'm going to fix it for next time. Oh Lord, everything. Where do I? <laughs> Where do I begin? I mean, it was like, it was the, you know, this was not only my first job as a show, this was my first job in television, right? Okay. So like, I didn't come from other people's writer's rooms. I'd never experienced any piece of making a TV show. And then I was the creator, writer, showrunner, and executive producer of my first thing. Yeah. So, like, hey, so, 
That, well, yeah, but also that was fraught. And I spent every minute of it, like, white-knuckling, even though I'm black, white-knuckling it through the entire experience uh, because it's what they don't tell you about it is just how much you're going to be doing. It's basically, a friend of mine said, isn't it like kind of being, like, in a burning house and and spinning, like, a million plates at the same time? And I'm like, kind of, like, it totally is. <laughs> at the same time, it's also the most rewarding gig I could ever ask for in yeah. life. Because you're able to touch every piece of it. And if you're a bit of a control freak, like I am, and you want to write the story in every single choice, yeah. there's no greater gig. Um, Did you talk to Lena about it? I, cause of she, course. She show runs? Yeah, she's show run before, so... I, I've talked to her at length and she uh, she gives the, I shouldn't maybe out her, she gives the most tremendous voice notes on your phone. Like she'll just, she will just leave a bit nice. of knowledge and I s- instantly keep, like I'm, sa- I save all of them because I'm like, <laughs> keep, keep. There's like a nugget of, of, of truth and, and she would make me a little bit braver along the way, you know, I, on a day where I'm just like, holy crap, they are trying to kill me. I know it. She, I would write her them and she would just leave just a little nugget of bravery that would make me feel like, okay, this is just par for the course. Like there, yeah. every showrunner feels this. It, you're not alone in it. And also it's not about you. It's about this tremendous thing you get to make. Yes. So leave all that aside and focus on the story. And at the end of the day, that's what carried me through. Just focusing on the Emery family and letting that lead. Well, it is a collaboration. So I want to ask you, um, and correct me again if I'm wrong, you you had a writer's room? You had to hire had a writer's room? Yep. Okay, so as someone who's never show ran and you know, you're know you in the sea as a showrunner, what were you looking for in your writers for your own staff? Well, we were looking for a number of things. I mean, a facility with horror and, and a love for genre was vital uh, because- mm. They had to be able to kind of deliver and scare you on the page. There was also a level of just character driven that we were after. We were after, you know, I'm not a big believer in just empty jump scares. I like the horror to be kind of rooted in something emotional and psychological. And so we were looking for writers who had a great affinity for character driven kind of genre writing. And then just a certain fearlessness on the page was key. And they had to be like fun people to hang out with because that's a lot of time. Yeah. Staffing time. <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of time to spend with people if you don't like them. So, and then for hiring directors, what, what's the position on hire, onboarding directors? Because you had a few different directors per episode. Yeah, it was, well, I mean, it was in any number of things, but one of them was that I, each of the directors who ended up doing the show were independent filmmakers that I, whose work I loved, particularly okay. in horror. Um, mm. Each of them had directed and produced and really kind of been an all-in-one shop for their own horror films or their own, like, low-budget indie films. Yeah. And I knew that that combination of, like, independent filmmaking chops, being able to keep a film running, which is difficult, but also, at the end of the day, having a very specific voice within genre genre filmmaking was the was the sort of litmus test and each of our directors had that i do want to say i don't know if you use a singular dp but the cinematography in this is freaking beautiful yeah it's it's we so lucked out so we used a few dps but the the our our main dp was check over race who shot who, who sort of set the look for the entire show and then xavier grobe and 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 suki these were our our second and our third dps but i would agree with you i love the cinematography in our show really, really beautiful. <laughs> wrap up because you know we've touched on everything i want to ask two final questions the first thing is what can you tell us about season two if you uh, can okay <laughs> that, that that there will be one i i know this i know how this works i know how this works i i tried the people listening be like well she didn't ask i tried y'all so again, don't fire me i tried it um my final question for you is something we ask all of our guests what advice would you give your younger writer self oh wow be kinder to yourself You know, I think I I spent a lot of time kind of worrying about where I was at and what was going on with my career and all of these things. And I didn't give myself enough, I didn't trust the path enough to know. And this is something that you don't really know. You know it in hindsight because you're old. (laughs) Uh, So then it's much easier when you're old to go like, yeah, man. But like the truth is like, if you could just have been kinder to yourself along the way, trust that there is something to be learned at every single step of the journey. No one tells you that part of running a show is being a great executive and having all these other tools that have nothing to do with writing. Yep. So um, managing budgets. All of those things. Therapy. (laughs) Mostly therapy, um, (laughs) if we're we're honest, and a few other things. But yeah, be kind to yourself along the way because you never know how your path is setting you up for success. I think that's wonderful advice for everyone to use, not just writers. Just giving yourself some grace is one of the biggest things that I've learned uh, in my short time here as well. Well, LM, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Congratulations on your first 
show running, writing, uh, <laughs> you see how he, he casually uh, titles. <laughs> that was very said, subtle, right? That was subtle. I said, I said subtle. what's your favorite color? And he said, well, as someone who's an executive <laughs> producer, showrunner, um, yeah, I like it. He's very modest. My mother would agree. Yes, I'm sure she would. <laughs> yeah. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure talking Thank to you. you. I look Thank forward you. to watching more of your work as you Thank grow you. in your career. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks to Little Marvin for coming on the show, and thanks as always to Charday Sellers for hosting. Them is available to stream right now on Amazon Prime. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Right on.